In the Radar 101 video, we talked about how radar waves are made and how they travel through the air. But we also talked about how a continuous stream of radar waves only tells us the direction, or azimuth, of a target. But that won't give us the range. So how do we figure that out? In this video, we'll go over how to overcome this challenge. The solution to the range problem is to send out radar waves and pulses. When we do this, we shut off the emitter and listen for returns. Then we can measure how long it took for a pulse to come back. Since we know the speed of our radar waves, we can do a quick calculation to determine range. In this example, we see that it took this pulse 600 microseconds to come back to our radar. Radar waves can travel one nautical mile in about six microseconds. So that means that the signal traveled 300 microseconds, or about 50 nautical miles each way. And that's the range to our target. The rate at which these pulses are repeated is the pulse repetition frequency, or PRF. And just like wave frequency, it's measured in repetitions per second, or hertz. It's important to remember that the PRF and the EM wave frequency are two separate numbers and can be completely different. The length of time that a pulse lasts is known as the pulse width. And this distance from the front of this pulse to the front of the previous pulse is the pulse repetition interval, or PRI. It's sometimes called the pulse repetition time or pulse repetition period. Whichever name is used, it's always going to be inversely related to PRF. So when PRF goes up, PRI naturally has to go down. Both have an important relationship to finding range, which we'll go over in a moment. There are two other terms that are good to know here, duty cycle and dwell time. Duty cycle simply means the percentage of time that radar waves are actively being emitted. So if pulses are taking up 5% of this time frame, that means the duty cycle is 5%. Dwell time is how long a radar beam spends on a target. So if it's scanning the sky quickly, it'll have a lower dwell time on each target. When it comes to detecting targets, we want to put as much radar energy on the target as possible to increase the chance of seeing a return. That's why duty cycle and dwell time are important but increasing them does have shortcomings, which we'll see later on. Pulse radars not only give us range, but they also allow us to use our emitter as a receiver. When the emitter is not sending out energy, it can work in reverse, listening for echoes. This way, we don't need a separate receiver. When one system does both jobs, it's known as a monostatic radar, which differs from a bistatic radar where there are two separate systems, one for transmitting and one for receiving. Early radars, like the chain home system used in Britain during World War II, were bi-static. These are some of the towers from the chain home system. The towers themselves don't actually transmit any signals. They're just there to hold up these wires between them. The wires transmit EM waves, which are then received by a separate set of receiver antennas. Now there's an important shortcoming with pulses that we need to understand. In certain circumstances, they can get echoes that are confusing. Let's take a look at this scenario to better understand how that works. We're sending out pulses every 1,000 microseconds, which is 1,000 times per second, or 1 kilohertz. During one of our pulse cycles, we receive a return here. Now this presents us with a problem because we don't know if it's a return from this pulse, or this earlier one. If it's from this second pulse, then it means the target is at 50 miles range. But what if it's a return from the first pulse? That would mean it's over 260 miles away. This phenomenon is known as range ambiguity, and the simplest way to fix it is to lower PRF. This increases the distance between pulses, which is another way of saying that we're increasing PRI. So if we lowered it to once every 2000 microseconds or 500 hertz, then we now have a larger gap between pulses to do our measurement. Let's say the return now shows up here, then we know that the target was at 50 miles all along. But if it stays over here, then we can be sure that it's at the longer range. Just remember, to solve range ambiguity, you want to use a lower PRF. That gives us a long, unambiguous range. But it comes at the cost of fewer pulses of energy on the target per scan. In other words, our duty cycle goes down. There's a lot of noise our receiver will pick up that could lower the accuracy of our track. So we want to put as many pulses as possible on the target to get the return's echo energy above the background noise. There are also some more advanced methods that can be used here, but we'll save those for a future video. The ability to find an object's range also gives us another tool we can use to solve a different radar problem. Everything that's radar reflective sends back a return. This includes the ground. So an aircraft facing down from altitude, like what you experience with airborne radars, that'll be flooded with ground clutter. It'll look like this, and it makes the radar essentially useless. 
Now if you remember back to when we went over azimuth resolution, there are small cells, kind of like pixels on the screen, that the radar can resolve. The same principle works for range too. We can resolve to a specific range cell and place gates around it. Then we can command the radar to only show returns within those gates. That way, any clutter from beyond the target is filtered out. Here's what that would look like. Here we can see our scope is filled with ground clutter. But once we lock our target, we put range gates around it. This eliminates all that unwanted noise from the ground. Now we can see there is a helicopter that was right in front of us the entire time. Pulsed radars let us determine azimuth and range on an aircraft. But they can have difficulty giving us an altitude. That's because the radiation pattern covers a pretty wide area. So an aircraft down here would give us a return just like if it was up here. It's common to see a search radar paired with a second height finding radar like this. These height finding radars are just like an azimuth scanning radar, except that they're turned on their side. Its only job is to find the altitude of the aircraft found by the search radar. When you have a radar that can only determine azimuth and range, it's known as a two-dimensional radar. More modern radars have better control of their emission pattern and can narrow down the position of a target. When a radar can find azimuth, range, and altitude without a second system, it's known as a three-dimensional radar. With the pulsed radar system like this, you can find the target's location. But one aspect that it can't track is speed. Now with some extra equipment like digital processing, it could remember all the locations in space over a period of time, and then use this to build up a rough idea of its speed. But there's an even faster way to do this. When an object is moving towards a radar emitter, the reflected waves will get compressed in front of that object. The opposite happens when that object is moving away from the emitter. This is known as the Doppler effect. You can measure the difference in wavelength between the echo and the wave the radar sent out. This can then be used to figure out the object's speed. That's going to be the topic of the next video in this series. We'll go into how pulsing is combined with the Doppler effect to get even more data about the target. I hope this video was informative and thanks for taking the time to watch it.